La ladies and gentlemen, I want to educate you about the hand. I am a clinical anatomist. I was for 45 years an NHS GP. I love anatomy, but I also love art and education. So I'm going to give you an education on the hand. And even just looking there, the title of the lecture, immediately you all thought I was going to lecture on football. Well, here's the football bit. There's Maradona with the hand of God in the famous time that he won and scored for Argentina, and we'll never forgive him for that. Um, there are lots of other things we're going to look at. We're going to look at art in the hand, and that's a wonderful circular drawing of Isha's done absolutely beautifully, so you don't know which hand is going round in which circles. How many of you can recognize what this is with the hand? Bruce Lee, the famous two-finger press-up, full marks. He was my hero when I was a, a young lad and doing A-levels, and I used to go to all the kung fu mo movies, and that's the famous two hands. Here, of course, we have rock climbers, and of course, rock climbers are the athletes of the hand par excellence, and I'm just always amazed that they can hold on to the cliff like this. Does anyone know what this is going to be about? You're all too young. 1968, it was a very famous time when in the Olympics, the black, and not only the black players, the black winners, or many of the black winners, put up their hands as a political gesture of black power. We'll come to that later. How many people can identify whose hand that is? I, I hope some of you can, but anyone here in the back of the audience know whose hand that is? The x-ray of whose hand? I'll tell you it is, it's Mrs. Rönchen. And he killed her. Mr. Rönchen, who, after whom x-rays are named, managed to kill his wife by x-raying her hand many times, and she died of leukemia. And that's their, her wedding ring on Mrs. Rönchen's hand. Interestingly enough, Rönchen is always given as the man who first got x-rays. He didn't. The year before, Tesla did. And it's interesting, if you look up the actual history, a year before, Tesla had a fantastic x-ray of a ankle. So let's move on and think about when did hands come into existence in the art world? Well, the hands came into existence in the art world tens of thousands of years ago, probably 30,000 years ago, and all over the world there are these wonderful spittooned hands. These are done usually by the, the native, whether he's a Neanderthal or a human, and we don't know in many cases, taking dye or soil or whatever in his mouth and going and making a pattern of his hand. And these are found in caves all over the world. But man obviously progressed, because 30,000 years ago, in the Ardèche region of France, we get caves with these magnificent paintings. Um, some of you may have seen the movie um, the, that was about these, but there is a fabulous movie done uh, by the German guy, and I've forgotten his name now. It's on there, but I've just forgotten his name. Oh, Werner Herzog. And Werner Herzog made a movie, a fabulous movie of these caves. These are 35,000 years ago. So how did man do that? Well, he did it with his hands. Those are wonderful 35,000 year, year old paintings done by cavemen, done by early man with his hands. So the hand has probably not changed really in 40 or 50 or even 100,000 years. This, for those of you in the world of anatomy, is a very, very famous front piece of the first textbook of anatomy by Vesalius. And it's interesting, not only did Vesalius do a self-portrait, but he did a self-portrait of him, his hand, holding the hand of the person he dissected. This is, in fact, from the second edition, the epitome, which this particular one I got from Cambridge. But we are showing the art of dissection, the science of dissection, and he is showing it as on the hand. He felt that that was the most important thing that he should illustrate. By the way, he was 28 when he published the first textbook of anatomy. So those of you who are at 27, you've got about a year to go. Uh, quite a remarkable chap. Um, we're not sure who did all the artwork. Probably Titian's team did it, but we're not sure. But that was the first anatomy textbook. And interestingly enough, from Italy, we now have artists that are using the... What happened there? Okay, let me go back. Artists that are using the hand as a way of painting the hand, and I'm going to use quite a few fo photos from this because I think they make beautiful cultural ideas. That is a painting of the hand. Now, hands talk. 
I was, I'm talking to you, use my hands, and many of you, if you're French, you particularly use your hands, of course. All right? But there may be some of you in the audience here who are hard of hearing, who've learnt sign language, and sign language is a very important thing. In fact, is there still an SSM here at Warwick in sign language for the students? There used to be one when I started off because it was a very popular SSM, a special study module for medical students because then they could communicate with deaf people and it can be quite useful, particularly in general practice. You'll notice there was even a stamp of the, um, uh, a stamp of the sign language a few years ago. Now, I need to use sign language. And I learned all about this when I started scuba diving because there are, how many of you have ever scuba dived? All right, there's quite a few of you. So all of you know that's up, that's down, that is danger. And you have a half a dozen signs that you use in scuba diving because you can't talk to each other. I found it very frustrating because I'm someone who likes talking. I do a lot of talking. And I was with my children learning to scuba dive. And we all went down together. And my kids were going like this to each other. And I thought, what on earth are they doing? My children had learned sign language at school so they could talk at the back of the class and when the teacher couldn't see them. And I couldn't talk, and it was very frustrating to have 10-year-old children who were talking behind my back, and I didn't know what the heck they were saying. So it can be quite useful as a way of communication. The hand talks. Just remember that. For many people, it's their way of talking. But of course, the hand has got much more than just the fingers and the muscles and the bones. It's the skin of the hand that is particularly important, particularly for discrimination and vibration and sensory. The fingertips are extremely, extremely useful as a way of seeing. I'd just like four of you there and Erin just to come down, and I'm going to do a little experiment now. I wish for you five to stand like this in a row so everyone can see with your hands behind your back and I'm going to put something into your hand and it's nothing nasty, I promise you. All right? Okay, so number one, you can all see what it is. Just put it there and you can feel it but don't say anything. Number two. Number three. Number four. And number five. So just feel them, don't look, please don't look. You are now using your finger touch proprioception as sight. And when we often say, oh, let me have a look at that, we don't mean let me have a look at that, we mean let me feel it, let me touch it, let me put it in my hand. So would you like to turn around and tell us what you think you've got in your hand? It's something we insert in the plug. It's a plug of some sort, excellent. Turn around, what do you think you've got in your hand? A walnut? Very good, a walnut cracker, very good. Turn around. An inhaler. An inhaler. Well, he happens to be a doctor and he recognises an inhaler. Turn around. A key ring. A key ring. What have you got in your hand? Lip balm. So five out of five, completely random. There was, no, there was no trickery in that, by the way. Most of you in this room can identify 95 out of 100 objects put in your hand. I can tell you that. I've done some experiments on it with medical students. Go on, sit down. Thank you. Uh, but what I'm trying to put over is that we don't look at things. We actually feel them with our hands, so our hands really do see. And if you're blind, you, of course, have your own language, Braille. I do think this is lovely. Chateau Neuf de Pat make Braille wine bottles. I mean, I, I, I thank God I don't need them, but it would be nice to be just to feel, to go along with and feel the, the, the names of all the wines on, in Braille. It must be wonderful for people who have no sight that they can even identify their own wine bottles by reading the Braille on the things. Now, when we come to the arts, how many people are happy to give a title to this picture? Come on, put up your hand as soon as you think what, you know what the title is. Look at the hands. What do you think the title is? Garden of, Eden. Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve. I don't care what the title is, but just from the two hands and the apple between them, and that was done in 1400s, you can pretty well recognize that the hands with two hands with an apple is likely to be the Garden of Eden or Adam and Eve. So it's something very important. There's a lot of cultural re recognition. Now, funny enough, there is someone in the audience that may even recognize both the person and where this picture was taken, because it was taken at Capit Hospital when I was doing my elective. And I'm telling you that, in fact, all my expenses from this lecture are going to a scholarship 
to send students to Borneo where this picture was taken, but look at her hands. She's from the Kayan tribe, and the tribes in that part of the world do wonderful tattoos on their hands, and intricate tattoos, and you can see that's part of their cultural, who is a upper class person, who is a lower class person, what people are cousins, or uh, in, in a tribal map is made on their hands. So the hands are part of art and part of culture for many people. I'll give you another wonderful instance. That, in fact, is a hamsa, which in both Jewish and Arabic culture is a hand to ward off the evil eye. You can see the eye in the middle there. That, in fact, is hanging in my door at home, the one in glass there. And the same sort of thing happens in the Indian culture. Many of you know that at weddings and great celebrations, people paint their hand as a semi, I don't want to say it isn't religious, but it's a semi-religious cultural entity. So the hands are something that we actually look at, that we adorn, that we make beautiful for particular special occasions. And, you know, it's is quite common within Hindu Vedic rituals to actually paint the hands for a special henna night, night before the wedding and things like that. So the hands again are something that people love adorning. Here in fact is an Arabic filial with the names of all the important uh, Arabic holy people written on the hand and this was carried down in a procession on a pole. So the hand is often used as a cultural entity to excite people to be involved. Now I mentioned before, that's the 1968 Olympics, a very important and very famous shot. Williams with his hand like that, having won a gold medal, standing there with a political statement. Now on the whole, the Olympics has not had politics, and this was very shocking when they did it. It really went the front page of every newspaper in the world, and that black power hand has also been made by many people in cultural entities as sculptures and things. Now it's interesting that that black power movement, I won't say has died, it hasn't died, but it's certainly gone quiet, because eventually, the, the Black Power Movement got a recognition that the rights of the people in the southern states in America were recognized and that has calmed down that very, I won't say virulent, but very strong Black Power Movement, which was always shown by the clenched fist. That was what was the sign of the movement. Rather like we have Gilets Jaunes these days, and all of us know that gilets jaunes wear those yellow vests and they block the road. It was the, the sign of the black power movement. Now, most people in this room are physicians or interested in medicine. And you can literally look over the last 500 years and every culture, every different culture, and shows up in its art, the physician, that one was 1700s, holding the hand of someone he's not meant to be looking at, probably a lady, because it would be culturally not nice for him to see the lady. And still, when you go to Afghanistan or you go to some of the very religious Muslim countries, you're not allowed to examine the ladies, and you actually, they put their hand or their leg or something through a hole in the wall to be examined. I've actually been in that situation myself with Bedouins, where I wasn't allowed to examine the lady, but she would just let me have an arm or a leg to do the examination, which of course is pretty useless medically. And then we have the famous Picasso one, and of course, Ayurvedic medicine in the Indian culture, showing the healing hand. The healing hand is very important. This one was taken from 12th century. I don't know if any of you have been to Naga in, 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 in Japan, but what a magnificent bronze hand. It's the world's largest bronze hand, by the way. So again, artistically, the hand has been used by many people. But the hand and its artistic uh, interest, if you like, was most important with someone like Leonardo. Now, those of you who may have been to, have, how many of you have been to a Leonardo exhibition? Oh, quite a few of you, good. And you'll know that his anatomy is magnificent. In fact, these are all one page, and I've enlarged the little pulleys. And you can see at the top picture up here are the pulleys of the hand. And I know there's a hand surgeon in the audience. This is 1480. This is 1490. No one has an anatomy textbook in the world. And this guy is producing artwork from dissection, which is 95% accurate. 
That's what's quite extraordinary about the guy. And nowadays, of course, it's the rock climbers that rip off those pulleys, but it's amazing that his picture, this one page here, this single page is A4 with 10 drawings that virtually give us every muscle of the hand. I won't go into details, but we'll look at a few of them in a minute. And of course, he was magnificent at sculpting as well. Here we have, or not he, sorry, Michelangelo's Moses, and look at how accurate, and even the veins on the back of the hand are very realistic. Look at the veins on the back of the hand of David. We have someone, Michelangelo, who again dissected the human body, and his portrayals in sculptures and in uh, paintings was wonderfully, magnificently accurate in the uh, uh, hand looking. So a lot of people ask, why were the hands so big in David? The answer to that is quite simply that David had been built, or built, he'd been sculptured, to go very high up in the piazza. And in fact, he ended up being at ground level. But if you're looking up four stories high on the Duomo of Florence Cathedral, you would have to make them bigger so they wouldn't look tiny little insignificant hands. And how he worked that out in, in, in perspective, I've no idea. But he was very capable of doing things like that. But when you look at them in the Academia, how many of you have seen David in the Academia? Quite a few of you, good. It's, it's awesome. I mean, you walk in there and you go, oh. It is stunning artwork, but the detail of the hands alone is really magnificent. They look as if they're real hands. I don't know if you know, but when David was originally paraded through the streets in 1505, the populace stoned the statue. They thought he had cheated and taken a man and built him 13 foot high. I mean, they couldn't comprehend how anyone could make a person look so human in stone. They thought it was black magic, and they stoned the statue. They also put a fig leaf on it as well, which is interesting. Another artist who was a magnificent artist of the hand was, in fact, Albrecht Dürer. Now, he comes from the Austro-Hungarian Empire, about the same time as Leonardo and Michelangelo, the end of the 1400s, beginning of the 1500s. This is his self-portrait. He really did have ginger hair, and he was a handsome dude. Um, and he did some beautiful drawings of hands, absolutely stunningly accurate. Would anyone like to suggest what the diagnosis is here? There are the praying hands. This person is trying to pray but can't put their hands together. Anyone give me a diagnosis of the praying hand syndrome? It's chiro Sorry? Chiro Very good. We have a clinician who is really on the ball here. All right. <laughs> Very good indeed. So if your per patient can't sort of pray properly and just can't get the hands together. Just think of diabetes if in your future career you're examining someone. There is other things like SLE and arthritis and things which can give a similar pattern, but diabetes is, 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 the, is the common one. And just look at these drawings here done by Albrecht Dory. He was very interested in the, in the proportions. He was actually, he was mad, mad. I've seen his book of 1505 where he recorded every measurement from every knuckle to the next knuckle and looked at the statistic analysis of how was the normal distribution on 100 or 200 fingers. And the whole book is figures. It just looks like some statistician gone mad. But his drawings of the hand were stunningly beautiful. I think you'll all agree, even the movements of these fingers up here and up here. What do you think that bulge is? Anyone anatomically, any student like to think what that bulge is between finger and thumb? It's important. We see it medically. What is it? It's normal, by the way. What is it? Ganglion. No, it isn't a ganglion. It's a good answer, but it's a normal muscle. What's the muscle there? He's hyper, he's made it rather obvious, but it is there. It's the first dorsal interosseous. And why is that important? Because the first dorsal interosseous is a median nerve muscle. And if that's weakened, then you should start thinking about median nerve, uh, sorry, not median nerve, ulnar nerve. And you should start thinking about what is going on of the nerves of the hand, which I'll look at at the end of this lecture. Isn't that amazing? I looked at that and thought, shush, how can you make a hand look like that? <laughs> it is magnificent, isn't it? What about the grip? 
Well, I started off mentioning that obviously the greatest people who have amazing ability of grip are in fact people like the rock climbers, how they can hang on like that forever. And that's why someone like Bruce Lee and the rock climbers do two finger press ups and hang by a curtain rail and walk around the room with one hat finger on a curtain rail to get themselves strong. But there are many different grips and you can see, but the one I want you to think about is the pad to side and the pad to pad. In other words, this grip, this is opposition. And pulp to pulp or pad to pad opposition is unique to man. And interestingly enough, Albrecht Dora did a wonderful self-portrait where he shows himself age 16 with his hand like that, saying, I am of the, the group man. And man's ability to make computers, to play the violin, to do art actually rests mainly on that ability of the rotation of the thumb to do pulp to pulp opposition. Pulp to side opposition, this one actually is very good in chimps and I'll show you a picture in a minute, but man is the only creature that can do pulp to pulp opposition with all his fingers. And if you look at the different gri grips, when they're children, we grip rather funnily and eat our food differently. When we use a hammer, when we throw a dart, when we actually are feeling something, and you'll see in a minute what that is, when we're holding a ball like in a statue or holding an egg or something like that, we have different rotations of different fingers. And this was from the Fontainebleau Art School, and it's showing a precision grip of pulp to pulp. All right? Those of you in the audience that need a little anatomy revision may remember that there are these interossei that lie basically in the palm of the hand. And there are palmar ones that are remembered by the mnemonic pad, and there are dorsal ones that are abducting and they're noticed, to, they're kept remembered by dab. So we have pad and dab. Remember that the second finger is the one to which we are moving from or to, and that's a convention. I actually am not sure why, well, I am sure why, because it's the one that doesn't move. But, but in fact, I don't know when, when that was actually instigated, but that is the, the international sort of recognition. And uh, pad and dab is the easiest way of remembering the interossei. Remember that all the interossei are ulnar nerve. When we look at a quick surface anatomy picture of the hand, you can see that there are tendons, there are tendon sheaths, there's these funny little muscles which you're going to look at in a second. There's a thenar eminence. In other words, when you look at your own palm, you can see there's a fat bit, the thenar eminence over the thumb area, and the less so on the finger side, the hypothenar eminence. And they're pretty obvious, but the important thing that clinically you all need to know about is the flexor retinaculum number 10 and going underneath it all the structures the nine tendons and the median nerve which are involved in a tightening of number 10 there and that's where we get carpal tunnel syndrome i think you can see the carpal tunnel beautifully illustrated there but the one thing that many people medically get him mixed up is the interossei and the lumbricals and the reason they get mixed up is because they've never actually dissected or seen the different size. And I want you to think of this guy doing this. Now, this is a dissection that I actually personally did, God, I don't know, 20 years ago. It's the dorsal expansion. So there's the main extensor tendon in the middle. And when we look, this is a lumbrical. This is a lumbrical with L, and this is an interossei, and this is an interossei. So there's a lumbrical and a lumbrical, and they insert, they come from the front, and they go round to the back. So both of them are involved in holding the hand in that position. In other words, you are extending your fingers and flexing at the knuckles of the metacarpophalangeal. So just think of that position. Now, if you're a rock climber and you're slipping down a mountain and you get to the edge of the ledge, which of those is going to save your life? Think. Is this little squidgy tiny thing going to hold you from slipping off the edge of the cliff, the lumbrical? I think not. It's a pathetic little muscle. It's called worm-like, and it is worm-like. It really is pathetic. But look at the size of the interossei. 
The interosseous are jolly chunky muscles and they're protected with bones each side of them. So when you're hanging off a cliff, if you like, like this guy, it's your interosseous that are going to save your life. However, when you're writing and you're doing these beautiful fine movements of up and down with your pen, that's when you're using your lumbricals. So although both of them actually control that position of extension and flexion, Remember that the interossei are going to save your life on a cliff. The lumbricals are going to help you write, do beautiful artwork or writing. Nice one. What about the anthropology? I know that's a giraffe, but it's just two hands, actually. Now, someone in the or two of you in the audience will recognize this person, and I have his full permission, I must add. He looks too young. It was when he was a junior student. This gentleman is, at, or was last year, the president of the American Association of Clinical Anatomists, and a, a, quite a senior anatomist with many hundreds of publications to his name. But he let me take this picture of him to compare him with a monkey. Um, <laughs> It's all right, I've known him since he was a student, so he didn't mind. But as you can see, his feet are slightly different from Charlie the Chimps, but his hand is not that different. In fact, you have to look very hard to see any difference between Marios's hand and Mr. Chimps' hand. Okay? And I can promise you that Marios is brighter than Mr. Chimp. Um, but what I want you to think about is how the difference is important. Here we have, from Sarawak, and there's someone else in the audience will recognize that, uh, the orangutan, and you see how the orangutan walks, he actually walks on his hands as well. And when he grabs something, as with the chimp, he can double lock, he can roll his fingers round things so he gets like a tighter grip. So his grip is particularly strong, not much less strong, ours is much less strong. And Mr. Chimp can do pulp to side beautifully. He can pick up nuts, he can pick up grubs, he can do what he likes, but he can't do this. He can't thread a needle. He can't do that beautifully delicate movement, which we can as humans. And here's the reason. I'm trying to make it simple. Here's our wak wak, our Malayan gibbon. Here's our orangutan, our chimps, our gorilla, and our human. And you can see the lovely progression that here, this is a hand for grabbing the trees and swinging through the trees, literally. Here, we're coming down more onto the ground, more onto the ground, more onto the ground, until we're totally on the ground, and we don't need to swing through the trees, or at least most of us don't. And if you look at the thumb, the thumb is too far down here to do anything useful, and it slowly moves up until we can do this beautifully. So it's the movement of the thumb that's given man the... I don't say the great advantage, but made us conquer the world rather than Mr. Gibbon, for instance. Also, there are some special things about the hand. Just think how many different things go on in the hand. We all know that if we are a criminal, we are not going to want to leave our fingerprints around. And yes, everyone in this room has got different fingerprints, and you've seen a million movies related to fingerprints and people cutting off fingertips and things like that in the movies. But actually, it is an important thing that all the fingerprints are looking like this. Under an SEM, that's what the sweat glands and the fingerprints look like. You can see the ridges beautifully shown. These are a, a colleague of mine at uh, UCL who does a lot of work with the SEM. And you can see the ridges are so beautifully shown on a scanning electron microscope. But what, where's the hand come from? Well, the hand is really rather special, and it starts as a paddle, literally, and the paddle starts getting a little bit more with form, and then slowly this paddle, number three, number four, number five, number six, it begins to break down tissue within the paddle, and the little fingers develop. That's how we are formed, all of us. So we grow little paddles out from the side of our abdomen, if you like, side of our chest, and those paddles are literally paddles, and then slowly the tissues break down between the fingers, if you like. Now, that actual anatomy and that embryology was actually 
discovered by a fellow called Professor Lewis Wolpert, FRS, who called it the French flag pattern. That if a cell was in the right order next to a red, a green, and a, a red, a, a white, and a blue, and the blue one is next to a white one, it says, I've got a blue one on the outside here, I need to die. And the signaling between the cells is known as the French flag pattern and uh, earned him a fellow of the Royal Society. But what does it mean for average doctors and for us in society? It means if something goes wrong, we can end up with an extra finger, we can end up with a finger that hasn't died off. So you can see in this particular one here with syndactyly that that tissue hasn't worked properly and we've got a double-sized finger. The tissue between the two fingers has not recognized that it's meant to die off in a development. And we have these abnormalities which quite frankly are quite common. It doesn't matter if you have an extra finger, that doesn't, uh, it doesn't matter, you can chop it off. But it's the same with toes as well. So, to make sure your brains are still working, I'm going to get you all to think about half a dozen cases. By the way, these are all real cases, and they've all been patients of mine. Or well, one of them hasn't, but all the others were. So this is a true story. A lovely West Indian lady of 70, who was a farmer, came into my surgery, and she said, Doc, I'm feeling tired and miserable. And she was visiting her sister, and my, my skin's going yellow, doctor. I, you know, I'm, I'm seen to be changing color. And if you look, that is the sister, and the two hands each side are my patient's hands. So I looked at them, and I looked at her, and I thought, hmm, 70-year-old lady, She's looking rather jaundice. I'll send off for a liver function test. And the liver function tests came back, and I was expecting them to be way sky high, and they were totally normal. So when I got her back in the next week, what did I start discussing with her? Anyone? This is a true story. Pardon? What she farms, good. So come on, think. This is a true story. This is a real GP case in North London. Any ideas? A spice. Very good answer. Very good. But I don't think there are any... Well, I guess turmeric might, but uh, very good answer. No, it wasn't turmeric. What's more common? Mustard. Sorry? Mustard. Mustard. Good answer, but not the right one. Pardon? The yellow flowers. Oh, yellow flowers. That's, a, again, a very good answer. It wasn't that, and it could have been, but I'll, I'll give you a clue on this. I've taken a picture of her hands, but her whole body was basically yellow. That's why I thought she had jaundice. Carrot. Carrots. You're getting very close. No, she doesn't have carrots, but she has something similar. What is in the Caribbean that looks like carrots? Pumpkins. And if you live in the Caribbean, many people in the Caribbean eat pumpkins for breakfast, dinner, and tea. And this lady not only grew her own pumpkin, she ate gallons of pumpkins. Pumpkin soup, pumpkin fries, pumpkin roast. She did everything as pumpkins. And it turned out that she had pumpkinemia. Now the common, no, you'll see it one day in your patients. The common thing that happens in Britain is what? What do we find in January turns up in GP surgeries quite commonly? I'm serious. I've had it four cases in my, in my medical history, all in January, all young children, all with bright yellow skin. And their mummies thought they were ill. What do you all eat at Christmas? Tangerines. Tangerines do exactly the same problem. And I have seen four children. I mean, you've got to eat like 10 tangerines a day, but kids do, and you'd be surprised. You know, if a kid likes tangerines and it's Christmas and there's a big bowl of tangerines, some kids just eat all the tangerines and they come in sometime a week or two later with, very weird, but they come in like this with yellow skin. So the secret with this is you have to take a very careful history. Sorry? Oh, is that why Trump's on? No, I think he uses suntan lotion. <laughs> okay, come on. All the medical students should be able to diagnose this chap. We're looking at a hand. And you can look at him, but the hand... Don't talk to the hand, talk to the face. Go on. Very good. This guy walked into the surgery, and it's obvious to me, and 
If you've never seen it before, it should be obvious to you. The question I asked him is, have you changed your glove, shoe, or hat size in the last few years? He said, oh yes, my glove size no longer fit me. And actually he had looked very enlarged hands. And acromegaly is the diagnosis. This is a lovely case. I asked this gentleman when I took his photograph. He was 82 and he wasn't well with something else and I knew that he probably would die within the next year or two. And this photo was taken 35 years ago. But it's taught many, many, many generations of students. He was an elderly man who at the age of four had an accident. I want you to look at his two hands and work out what did he break and what was the result of his fracture and why are his hands so different. He had a simple fracture in 1930 something, I think it was. Yes, it would be 1930 or 1920. It was a long time before the health service. He couldn't afford to have the fracture dealt with properly and he ended up growing normally except for this hand. And you can see the arm looks a bit funny there. Where do you think the fracture was? Anyone? Come on, think. Sorry? I can't hear, sorry. Distal humerus, all right. Could be the distal humerus. In fact, it was the elbow. It was the elbow itself, all right. And he damaged a nerve which never grew. Now, I want you to look at his hand. Look at the two thumbs. And they're actually the same size, aren't they? But look at the fingers of one hand and the fingers of the other hand and the size of the palm. What do you think has not been growing normally? Which nerve? Very good. This guy had an ulna palsy from the age of four. And I show you this to make you realize that tissues need nerve supply to grow. We tend to think of nerves being damaged when we're adults and therefore muscles wasting or things going wrong with the, the, the nerves. But in reality, this guy gives you a wonderful observation that the median nerve area grew normally and he has a normal thumb, but the palm itself and the fingers, and if you look carefully, he has a little sign there which would make you think he had an ulnar palsy. He has a a clawing of his little finger. But look at the palm. The actual interossei have never grown, and so the palm has stayed like a little child's palm compared to an adult one. Okay, so let's look at case four. The right hand is normal, all right? The left hand is trying to copy the right hand. And as you can see, it just isn't very good at doing it. In fact, it's pathetic. They've tried to open out the hand here, and the person can't. That's why we took all the photos. Because you've got a useless left hand. What do you think is the damage? Look at the shape of the arm, or the, the hand and wrist. That's the normal, that's abnormal. It's the same on both sides, obviously. Anyone? What do you think this person has had. Could be a bike accident. Come on. No. They're finding that they're in this position. They've got what? What do we call that? A wrist drop. What gives you wrist drop? A radial nerve. This person had a humeral fracture with a radial nerve that wasn't treated. And there's the commonplace. I have to say, my own experience over 45 years practicing medicine, nearly all the radial nerve problems I've seen were due to fractures of the humerus in people that had secondary spread. And it's interesting, it may be just the population I saw, but certainly the humeral fracture is not rare in people who, let's say, had breast cancer 20 years ago. So I get an 80-year-old lady who just just fallen, not even heavily, and fractured the humerus, and then comes in with a radial nerve. And there's the radial nerve. It spirals around the humerus and gets damaged in a humeral fracture. OK, look at the hand on the right. First of all, look at the black arrow. And what can you see? You can see a hollow. 
All right, you see a hollow with no muscle here, a big hollow. What's that going to tell you? No tricks. If you haven't got Athena eminence, what's, what's been messed about with? The median nerve. Now I take you to a little bit more detail. I want you to look at the dissection and look at number 18, which is a tiny, tiny little mus uh, nerve going up here. Why would that be useful in your diagnosis clinically of what has happened in this patient? Good or a what? Full marks. Full marks. Make a good clinician. So that little nerve is the sensory branch of the median, superficial palmar branch, which goes over the carpal tunnel, so it isn't affected. So you can tell whether it's the carpal tunnel or the injury is higher up by testing the sensation over the thena eminence. If the sensation is normal, then you need to look further down the arm for the absence or the damage to the median nerve. Whereas if the sensation is uh, um, normal, it's likely to be higher up. Whereas in the carpal tunnel, it's going to have, um, it's, it's, it, the carpal tunnel is going to be normal, where if it's a higher up one, they will have lost sensation as well as muscle damage. Now, these are three different cases. One of them is a mild abnormality here. You can see that's very flat and a mild abnormality here. This one looks very scaly and there seem to be missing bits of fingers. And this one has got what we call guttering. And you can see why it's called guttering. This hand has lost muscles in between the tendons and particularly lost the dorsal interosseous first muscle. Would you like anyone to suggest three different diagnoses for these three cases? This is simple. What do you think this is? Sorry? Oh, it could be, but what do you think is damaged to cause that little bit of, 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 of flatness there and a little bit of clawing there? An ulnar nerve. And in fact, it was an ulnar nerve injury from a knife wound in the forearm. Okay, look at this one. Look pretty shabby, those hands. The skin looks abnormal. They've lost a finger. What about the hand surgeon? I bet you've not even seen a case of this. I guess steroderma. Very good answer. It isn't. And that's why I said you've probably not seen a case of this as a hand surgeon. What won't you see in this country? Leprosy. Leprosy. Well done. I mean, I, you might see it, but I don't think there are many cases. Uh, this was a patient I had who was a lepromatous patient. Interesting enough, again, in Borneo. Um, and what does this look like? It looks like they've lost an awful lot of muscle. What sort of diseases lose muscle? Yes. Yes, it was motion urine disease. Absolutely. So this is a much, I didn't show you the rest of the body, but this is a really absent of muscles with normal sensation. So that is almost, uh, well, it was in fact a motion urine disease, a horrible disease, I must add. <coughs> this last one, or no, next to last one, is a medical student, genuine medical student who I found in the lab one day who was complaining that she had problems with her fingers. And I said, oh, but you've got a scar in your neck. Tell me more. Do you mind if I take your photograph and use you for teaching? And she said, no. I do that all the time, by the way, with my patients. Some of these photos are 40 years old that I've taken as a GP. But here is her clavicle. Okay, she's no longer able to play the violin, which is a disaster for her because she was a very good violin player. And you will see there is a hollow underneath the scar that she has just above her clavicle. So if she's got a scar around the clavicle, why do you think anyone would be operating in that region on a young lady who'd come complaining of problems in her hand? Any suggestions? Very good, very good. Which part of the brachial plexus is it going to be if it's up there? Oh, oh yeah, come on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. In fact, it was T1. She actually had a cervical rib. 
okay? And the cervical rib was causing her problems that she couldn't do the violin. So she went to the surgeon and said, well, we'll take out your, your um, cervical rib and your, everything will be good. Well, it wasn't. Because when they took out the cervical rib, in fact, she ended up with a weakness in her first dorsal interosseus, which made it not good from a point of view of a very fine movement. She was quite good at doing most things, but her fine movements had gone, and it didn't help with things like violin play. So it just the, the message is, don't let the surgeons operate unless you have to. I can give you a few stories of that, by the way. <laughs> I'm not anti-surgeon, I've just got my own experiences. And here is the last one. Both these folk have sustained the same injury. Would anyone like to say what you're looking at? I've only seen two cases in my whole medical career, but having said that, if you don't follow up this particular injury and check, the results are like this, which are horrendous. Any medical student like to work out what's gone here on here? These are two patients, there's one, there's the other, that have had the same fracture as youngsters and they lost something and it wasn't, it wasn't a nerve. Shout, well done. You better go into surgery or become an anatomist. Volkmann's ischemic contracture. The reason is when you have a supracondylar fracture of the elbow, you may remember the median nerve you would all test for, I hope, but remember the brachial artery lies next to the median nerve. If you get a damage to the brachial artery, you end up losing all the tissues in the front of the uh, arm, in the forearm, and you end up with a useless, completely destroyed forearm. So this is a Volkmann's ischemic contracture, named after the guy that described it, Mr. Volkmann. So to end on a nicer note, a famous painting by Rembrandt, it used to be the front cover of Grant's Atlas many years ago. It's a lovely painting. The anatomy is totally wrong, by the way. <laughs> Don't let that worry you. But this is on the wrong side. It, there's a whole book written on that, but the actual origin of the flexors of the forearm on the wrong side, but it's a wonderful painting, The Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Tulp. You can see how much art has been influenced by the hand, how much painting has been influenced, how much socially the hand has been of value and is very important. And someone who I thought was going to be here tonight, sorry, Actually, that's where the abnormality is wrong, where the anatomy is wrong. Uh, gave me a painting for a lecture I was giving, and he replaced Dr. Tulp, and he replaced the anatomy with the, the scans. But sadly, he isn't here today, and he just wrote to me and said, I'm sorry, I'm really ill at the moment, and he couldn't come tonight. But I thought you would be interested to see the comparison. And to finish on, with apologies to Michelangelo, the hand can be quite expressive. Thank you. <laughs> to learn the anatomy of the hand is pretty important. And it isn't just the nerves, though the nerves are very important. It's the nerves, the arteries, the muscles, and what the hand can do. Because often patients come in and say, Doc, I can't open a bottle. Doc, I can't unzip my trousers or something like that. It's simple things that patients come into you and you have to think how are they holding their hand and what muscles or what ligaments or what you know, bones are, are, are sore. And there are of course all the diseases of, and I didn't want to go into any of those, but there are all the diseases of medicine virtually can show in the hands as well as the nails. So one could do a complete lecture on nails of the hand or on abnormalities within the bony structures of the hands in arthritis and all those. I don't want to do that with you. I want you to think of it as a much more uh, entirety. The hand has been used for culture, for art, for medicine, for science, and just think where the hand comes from and how it develops. All of those things you need to know to understand the importance of the hand. And very interesting, isn't it, that all five people identified something which really is quite difficult if you think about it. They're not, I mean, you know, you didn't think you were going to get a walnut cracker. I mean, you know, and, and, and it didn't take any of you more than 
30 seconds to work out what the thing was in your hand. When you say to people, let me have a look at it, you actually mean, let me feel it, let me see it. And you don't mean see, you mean see it with my fingers. And it's interesting, of course, hands can go around a corner. Vision can't. So sometimes when you're you know, trying to find something you've lost under the bed, you've sort of got your ah, I've got it. And you know what it is. You, know, you lose your glasses and they fall under the bed. You immediately know where they are and you can feel them and you know it's your glasses. It's a very, very useful tool is the hand. And if anyone wants to buy me a Braille bottle of Chateauneuf de Pape, I'm very happy to receive it. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.